Hi, I'm Chris Ames, and it's good to uh, speak with you today about uh, big data and cervical deformity surgery. And a lot of what I'm going to be discussing um, comes from our work in the International Spine Study Group and a collaboration with the European Group in the thoracolumbar spine. And I'll draw some parallels and show you how cervical surgery, uh, cervical deformity surgery in particular, has has started to move into that area uh, where the limitations are right now and how we can uh, begin to overcome some of those limitations. My disclosures. I think it's no secret that US healthcare uh, right now is extremely costly and shallow. And uh, it's based on a correlation analysis, some simplistic data platforms, but really, uh, the whole idea is to try to move this into the area of deep medicine, as Eric Topol uh, talked about quite a bit in his book, um, Deep Medicine. If you look at, uh, for comparison purposes, uh, back to 1975, we had 4 million healthcare jobs. Now we have 16 million. Healthcare spending per person was 550 per year. Now it's over 11,000. We have less time to see patients. Percent of GDP being spent on healthcare is very high and our room charges are high and we have different data points now and really healthcare not only being a lot more expensive per person but it's really moved in a bit of a different direction maybe away from direct emphasis on the patient and more to data points and this has been good and some of it's uh, really not been been good if we take a step back and look what's going on in cervical surgery uh, in particular we see a rise in uh, flat neck deformity um, from a uh, lack of attention to the sagittal plane. We see uh, more and more people spending more and more time uh, inclined uh, on their devices. And it's not surprising that then we see an increase in the uh, amount of cervical deformity surgery going on. We did a deep dive on this um, with Depew Sintes uh, looking at an industry databases several years ago. And we saw a remarkable increase in posterior spinal fusion, posterior cervical fusion uh, for deformity. When we compare that to non-deformity, you see a significant difference in the compound annual growth rate. And then furthermore, if you look at the demographics, we see that the patients having surgery for the cervical deformity are older, significantly older, and also quite a bit more frail. This is an example of the very frail patient from my particular practice. Uh, we see uh, that in general, they yeah. have cachexia, uh, some wasting, and a significant uh, increase in the number of comorbidities uh, per patient with uh, a rapid increase in those having six or more comorbidities uh, over the years. And these are the patients we're being called upon to treat in the setting of a shallow medicine platform uh, and increased costs, as I'll discuss. So we definitely know that a storm is coming. So think in your own mind uh, what you would do um, to combat that. How would you improve the care of these patients? Uh, improve the quality, save cost. You know, what is a solution? So is a solution a, uh, another pedicle screw or another lateral mass screw or a different rod? Uh, well, probably not. Um, probably, uh, and this is something that industry is gonna have to work on as well, uh, we're going to have to move from shallow to deep medicine and uh, figure out ways for industry to monetize software and become pathway and risk sharing companies and get away from just thinking that they're going to sell you something and that's going to be their revenue stream. We look on the right, that's the number of FDA approvals in the last several years and most of those, most of those have not been in surgery actually. Uh, they've been in other areas of medicine such as pathology and radiology but it's moving into surgery and I'll show you how uh, that's going on. So let's, um, let's think for a moment, um, how can you utilize human intelligence potentially to uh, improve outcomes and decrease cost and improve care? So one way uh, is the so-called collective intelligence approach using human intelligence, where a panel of surgeons, much like a tumor board gets together and tries to decide, for example, who's the best cervical deformity patient to operate on who's gonna have low complication rates and, um, and uh, less cost and, and better outcomes. Well, unfortunately, although surgeons would say differently, if you actually look at the data, surgeons are inherently terrible 
at figuring out who's likely to benefit from surgery. This is one of many studies uh, published in recent years. This was for general surgery where the surgeons did a terrible job of predicting risk and benefit from common um, general surgical operations. We have data showing this is also true in thoracolumbar deformity surgery. And furthermore, um, and I didn't put this slide in, but surgeons are a bit better at determining risk than they are at seeing the future and predicting outcome. They can predict you know, that the uh, 70 or 80 year old patient with a lot of cardiac morbidity is likely to have a complication, but they're not really uh, good at predicting how that patient would do if they survive uh, two years out from surgery. So one technique that we've utilized using a big data approach in both thoracolumbar and cervical deformity surgery is the develop development of a frailty index. Uh, utilizing rather than just a review of systems that was developed out of family practice, we use a review of systems uh, that is based in a predictive metric, uh, which is frailty, looking at 40 different data points. Um, and frailty is basically an assessment of a vulnerability to an insult, whether that be a fall in a nursing home or surgery. Uh, we developed the and published the adult cervical deformity frailty index that was intimately linked to risk of major complication. And uh, frailty versus non-frail uh, patient was actually uh, even more predictive of complication than type of approach. Um, and severe frail versus frail was more predictive than even three column osteotomy. So this was quite uh, a good index that is available real time uh, in the medical record at my institution to predict uh, risk of surgery. Alongside that, we wanted to take a big data approach to the operation, and we developed uh, an index that actually uh, datifies the procedure, gives it a point scoring system, and this point scoring system was linked to length of stay uh, and blood loss and case length. So this forms a big data approach to a conversation with anesthesia about what they're likely to experience during an operation and it completes the set of the datifying the patient through frailty and then datifying the procedure um, through uh, an invasiveness index. And this is exactly the same approach that we used in the thoracolumbar spine, and it worked uh, quite well uh, as the beginning point of taking a big data approach um, to uh, the problem. However, there's probably a better way. And we have moved over the last several years to taking a bigger data approach utilizing predictive analytics uh, and AI that looks at the entire uh, procedure, the interaction between all the different variables, uh, the patient, the procedure, the location, um, and, uh, and the types of osteotomies, for example, and, and whether, where the patient is operated on, what surgeon does it, and all of this, the interplay between all these variables probably gives us a more accurate prediction than just relying on an index. So this has been our approach uh, over the last uh, several years. Well, one, uh, one idea is to start to look at outcomes as we start to build some of these engines and figure out you know, how we're doing and how we can optimize outcome. And in order to do that, we need to understand what contributes and what produces an outcome. If we're gonna predict it, that's gonna give us information on that. If we take an honest look at how we're doing in cervical deformity through a study that Justin Smith did with ISSG, we see that we're not moving the needle tremendously if we look at overall average values for these patients at one year post-op. No matter what metric uh, you really look at, uh, EQ5D, uh, the um, uh, NDI, or uh, the pain scores. So one possibility here um, and starting to look at outcomes and to build them into the risk benefit equation is to again move from shallow to deep. And again, I refer you to Eric Topol's book, which is excellent, where he quotes a study published in Nature called Personalized Medicine Time for One Person Trials, where they look at commonly utilized drugs. And surprisingly, uh, it's well known that only a few percent of patients actually are responders to some of the most commonly used medications. This has impacted really all, all fields of medicine that are starting to use big data and analytics in trying to uh, allocate resources to those that are likely to benefit the most and to figure out what subset of the population um, is likely to benefit most from a given intervention. So how do we do that in, in deformity surgery? Well, we built classifications and we thought, okay, if you drink the, the, the Kool-Aid, so to speak, of the sagittal plane, and you do a, a good operation that realigns a patient, that you're gonna get a given uh, result. However, 
that's based in antiquated thinking because it's based in correlation analysis, which was the best we had at the time. But now we realize that R squared values, you know, of 0.2 are not really what's going to determine uh, well uh, an outcome. And same for if you look at two-year ODI, two-year ODI SVA fused to pelvis, really the relationship even disappears. So we need to take a deeper medicine approach uh, to cervical deformity surgery, learn from what we've done in thoracolumbar surgery, and now I'll show you how we can begin to do some of that. Well, one way we can do it is through what's called unsupervised clustering. We developed uh, an unsupervised machine learning based clustering analysis for um, our work in thoracolumbar spine. And essentially, it compa we compare here in this slide how a surgeon sees the patient versus how the machine sees the patient. So if you look on the left, we give the, the surgeon gives the patient a frailty score. They may talk about them in a conference. And on the right, um, this is how the computer sees the patient. Immediately in real time, surrounded by the nearest neighbors, and you can compare uh, 10 patients that had similar procedures that were uh, similar in looking at basically 100 different data points. And that's really beyond what human uh, intelligence can do. We can't stratify patients and pull up the 10 patients that most resemble a patient and cluster them in a particular subtype. So uh, initially, our classification in um, thoracolumbar spine uh, adult deformity was based on correlation analysis. Now we've published a new classification based in AI and based in clustering analysis, which is essentially a risk benefit equation for that particular patient, which is really what surgeons uh, and patients want to know. Uh, if you look in the upper left, you can compare the patients that had the greatest ODI improvement in certain clusters versus those that had high complication rates. And what you see, which is kind of counterintuitive and which goes against the way that human intelligence deals with these issues, is we see that the patients that had the greatest improvement actually had the highest complication rate in that particular cluster. And that's what clustering allows us to do. So <clears throat> if we look at how we can move cervical surgery into deeper medicine. Let's start where we began. We started again, just like in thoracolumbar spine, with simple correlation analysis with the sagittal plane. The best we ever got was about 0.3 or 0.4, and we built a classification around that. And we thought, okay, if we just get the zero modifiers in our realignments, these patients are going to do well. Well, we can go uh, deeper now, and we can say there's a different way to do it. And Hanjo Kim and Virginia Lafage in our group this year. Uh, published a great study uh, looking at utilizing in a, in a similar fashion unsupervised uh, clustering to uh, identify three different types of patients. Um, and these patients all uh, probably would benefit from different types of treatment. So if you take a cluster type one, that's a flat neck patient. They don't have enough cervical lordosis to compensate for the T1 slope. Um, but they don't need a massive operation going down to the lower thoracic spine. They usually get by with a CT, C2 to T1. Group two, uh, again, developed by the computer, clustered by the computer, uh, are our patients with a simple focal deformity that can have an anterior surgery or a short posterior fixation. And then group three are our rigid, uh, severe deformities that often will need a procedure into the upper thoracic spine. And so you can imagine a very similar type of clustering and nearest neighbor analysis coming soon from our group where we can pull out the most similar cervical deformity patients. You can compare the operations they had and you'll get a risk benefit plot. And this is where this line of research in our group is going, uh, but this is kind of where we are right now in terms of a clustering and nearest neighbor analysis. It will probably be at some point predictive and prognostic as to what type of operation they had, they should have. Um, one of the uh, most interesting aspects of clustering is what it can do for clinical trial design in cervical deformity surgery. We came from a simple correlation analysis and we've moved uh, uh, over time into predictive models. And now is a time where we can utilize clustering to potentially move into counterfactuals and actual causation. And uh, we've moved from the, the basic classification schemes uh, up into different types of models. And what we've been able to do then is you can cluster patients into different subtypes, as I showed you, that have greater treatment effects, uh, greater power and, and impact of treatment. 
And what this allows us to do then is to structure clinical trials that are likely to have greater effect size with a far fewer number uh, of patients. And this is what we're doing in the thoracolumbar spine. And we hope to utilize clustering as the first step in designing randomized clinical trials to the cervical spine that won't need that many patients because the effect sizes uh, will be larger. Now, um, to finish up in the next couple of minutes, um, our group uh, in the thoracolumbar spine, the ISSG, ESSG collaboration, which we call Global Spine Analytics, has developed predictive models of major complication. You can look at the, the spread in the predicted risk of complication in our database. And again, think to yourself, wow, if we really quoted someone an average value of a complication, that would not be very uh, precise. What we wanna do is place a patient on this type of graph where we can say, this is your specific risk of a major complication at every time point from surgery from day zero out to two years. And we've been able to do this in the thoracolumbar spine, and we hope to bring this uh, to cervical deformity surgery sometime soon once we accumulate uh, more patients in our database. <clears throat> in a similar fashion, um, what we wanna do is predict uh, outcome. <clears throat> if you look at the hip literature, you can see that even though they had uh, over 100,000 uh, patients, that when you quote a patient an average value of, um, uh, of improvement, what really what you're quoting that patient is uh, only representative of 5% of the sample set. And that's what we've been doing for years and years in deformity surgery, is quoting patients really an average value uh, of clinical improvement from a, a large scale study. Most of these were less than 70% or over 90% improved. If you look at our database in particular, uh, only 6% of patients had an average improvement. And you can see the tremendous heterogeneity in the outcomes of the patients from this large scale adult deformity uh, database. We developed uh, deployable predictive models that could predict every aspect of outcome across every major outcome um, instrument. And this has brought us to the modern workflow uh, which we hope to bring to cervical surgery in the next couple of years. So if you look at a thoracolumbar patient, uh, we measure them out, and this could, would be done in a very similar way to the cervical deformity patient as I show you here. We generate an automated frailty index. This would be the cervical frailty index in the medical record. We classify and cluster them, uh, cluster them on the cervical uh, scale. And then, the, then we develop options, surgical options and plans, and we generate a complication profile. Now I'm gonna show you our calculator, which we use for the thoracolumbar spine. We enter demographic data, uh, comorbidity data, radiographic data, and HRQOL data. And then we can generate plots like this. Uh, this is available right now to our research groups where we can develop, uh, where we can predict major complication from time zero to two years. Uh, reoperation and readmission. And HRQOL outcomes come in this sort of graphical form uh, with likelihood of improvement uh, looking uh, like this. So this is what we have right now on the thoracolumbar spine and um, where we already have a frailty index for um, the uh, cervical spine. We have an invasiveness index for the cervical spine. So you can tell right now we're moving from generating these indices to trying to move and generate calculators similar to what we have generated for TL deformity for cervical deformity. And um, just in the last couple of minutes, cost is a major issue in these procedures. They're generally not considered to be cost effective with one year uh, uh, ICER ratios over $600,000. Uh, we can also utilize predictive modeling to direct resources because we can predict outcome prior to surgery and complication rate. So we can select out at the population level, for example, in Spain or in Germany or in US, how much money we have to spend and what segment of improvement uh, and complication rate we're willing to tolerate. And we can generate um, data fields like this where you have different complication rate filters, different MCID filters, and you can see the uh, number of patients getting surgery decreases as you increase the stringency of those filters. And just some basics, if you look at 50% chance of MCID, we decrease surgery by 16%, 50% chance of complication by 28%, and greater than 50% chance of MCID and less than 50% chance of major complication, we reduce uh, the spending approximately 
by 500 uh, million US dollars. And this is a simulation analysis that we presented at the uh, SRS this year uh, for the thoracolumbar spine. So I'm a little bit over time. I think I'll stop there. Uh, it was a real pleasure to speak to you today about our work uh, in uh, predictive analytics and how we're trying to, to make up some time and bring cervical deformity surgery more rapidly into the realm of big data. We're partially there, not completely there yet, uh, at least in the realm of cervical deformity. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.